welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are now in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I'm David. And you guys are in for a treat today. So we have a time bender. We've talked about bending time and how we can manipulate it to our benefit. And this person, I think, just in our talks before our podcast, sounds like she is a person that is doing that. So listen to these credentials, folks. So in 24 hours, she crams in being a physician, an author, and a mom. She has been featured on CBS News, Women's Day, Red Book, Good Housekeeping, and others. And she found enough time to talk to the homies on the podcast. I'm so excited. Welcome on our show today, Dr. Sandra. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks thanks for making it. And um, I, I want to bring a little bit on what we were talking about out uh, before the podcast. Uh, we are here in Atlanta, and you are in Birmingham. And it sounds like we're on two different planets because everyone here in Atlanta <laughs> – if they're in town, OTP or WOTP or o- outside the perimeter, everyone still figures that they're sitting an hour or two in traffic going and coming, and their quality of life is actually what we're going to talk about today because you're talking about not only is traffic bad, but the workplace may be making us sick. Is that correct? Absolutely. And that's the thing, because everybody can't do what I did and just kind of switch locations. What I'm having to try to help people do is figure out how do we use these stressful times to de-stress and to detoxify ourselves so that we don't end up going home from a long day and, and being upset and stressed out and taking all of that bad energy just into our homes and with our families. That's interesting in itself because when you said you take it home to your families, right, they're, <laughs> they're like, could you, could you go back outside and, and come back in like an hour and such, and you're upset with them, and it really has nothing to do with them. No, and it happens so much. You know, I, I have so many people who will come to me and say, you know, my marriage is suffering because of my job. I leave my job, and I, I come into work. I'm in an okay mood. Within a couple of hours, I am, my neck's hurting. I've got a headache. I'm mad at my my coworkers or employees. I don't want to be here. And then I get in the car, and depending on where you live, you may sit in traffic between 30 minutes to two to three hours, depending on location. And then you finally get through the door, and the only thing you want to do is veg out because you've been sensory overloaded, emotionally, mentally. You've been overloaded in every area. And so that's what I talk with people about. First of all, understanding that there are really seven key areas that we can all get depleted in. And so we have to look at how do we then restore those areas so that we, we enjoy our life again. Mm-hmm. Now, since this is a homies podcast, I do have to make reference to Chuck D. from the popular public award-winning Public Enemy. And in one mm-hmm. of his songs – he mentioned that we are paying mental rent for corporate presidents. How does that resonate oh, with good. you? that's good. That is good because that is so true. Um, you know, so often what ends up happening is people, you know, one of, the, one of the big issues that a lot of people have is that they can't sleep well or that they feel like they're tired all the time. You know, over 40 million people are sleep deprived, a third of the population. And, and a big part of that is the mental unrest that we have, you know, if you've ever had that time when you lay down in the bed, and we call it a monkey brain, but it's like your thoughts are like leaping from one thing to another, and you're trying to figure out how how to quiet your mind, what ends up happening is all of that mental space is being taken over by someone who really does not care about the end result, like a renter. You know, a renter comes in, if the the wall gets busted, that's not their problem. Somebody else has got to deal with that. That's kind of how those thoughts come at us. 
because at the time, they're just jumping around sporadically. And that's where we have to really be aware of our thought life and how we are allowing things to process so that we take back control and we, we understand that what we allow in that space will do damage unless we, unless we start monitoring it better. Can we go, I want to go back on the timeline for a brief second. Uh, so just humor me, Dr. Sandra. So mm-hmm. we had an economic downturn about 10 years ago. And so many industries were affected. And so people were out of work or they were underemployed. And they wound up taking a lot of jobs that they wouldn't have in good economies, right? And so if you fast forward now, uh, some people may still be in those positions or they may be like paying this mental rent like you're saying and they're going to get laid off regardless if they work 80 hours a week or not. So what is your what is your current framework for the environment that uh, exists? I, want, I don't want to say that exists today because businesses go in cycles. And so everyone's kind of happy now, and they kind of they forget that we may be right on the precipice of another downturn. Yeah, it really depends. <clears throat> excuse me. It really depends on where they are seeing themselves in that process, because you know, you in most situations, you can either look at it from the standpoint of a victim or a victor. You either enter the workplace feeling victimized because you had to take a job that you didn't feel necessarily lived up to your expectation or you entered that job as a victor knowing that you made that personal choice. No one made you take it. You, 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 know, you are in control ultimately, which means you can leave or look for other options. So first the mindset of kind of how someone entered into the workplace plays a big part of that. But then once someone's in it, let's say if you're in a job that you're not 100% uh, committed to, you're, you're not loving it, but you're making good money and you don't necessarily want to leave, then what I have people do is really evaluate how that job is affecting you. How is, what is the work-life integration looking like? Is the job being toxic to your life, or are you able to segment it so that you, you can kind of contain it in a way that it doesn't seep over into every other aspect? Because most people are seeing the seepage, where their job is actually making other parts of their life more toxic and actually bringing down their quality of life. And when that happens, something's got to change because otherwise you're going to change and you're not going to change in a good way. Hmm. Dr. Sandra, let me ask you this. So you say in 2008 you read that, that study, that large study that was out and you were, and some of the um, statistics you, you know, you kind of disturbed you whatnot as far as 55% of us deemed our lives as difficult and or struggling. Why do you think at that time, when you were reading that study, it had such an impression on you as opposed to or where was, what was going on with you at that time that it had such an impression as opposed to, like, let's say you read it the year before that, and you might have read it and said, wow, that's, an, that's a sad statistic, and then just went on with your life and not thought much about it. Honestly, because it was talking about me. Um, at that time, that was around the time that I was, I was starting to kind of experience my own burnout from my job and and starting to really see how living a life where you are, you're an overachiever, you're the type of person who likes to get stuff done and you're pushing all the time. You've always got your grind on, but you're never allowing that time to be able to enjoy what you are producing. You're never taking a a moment to step back and to reflect on things and to put up some strong personal boundaries so you don't get stepped on by other people. When, when that happened to me, and I was at a position in 2008 where on the outside everything looked so phenomenal. I mean, from most people's standpoint, they would have automatically says, said I was a success. I was in all sorts of magazines, prevention, Red Book, on Fox, all this stuff going on. And I felt at the lowest point of my life with a job and a career that I had created. You know, these were all the things that I created. And so that's when it really struck me that I can, I understand these 55% because I'm one of them. And so what good does it do to be successful from the outside when you, you have lost yourself in the process? And I, and for me, it was a very simple, some very simple tweaks. 
to learn how to get back on track, and really those things all had to do with learning how to rest and not in the conventional sense like take a vacation, (laughs) but uh, really understanding kind of the the breakdown of what rest looks like in someone's life and how to use it to restore the parts of our life that that have broken down. Mm, Kind of makes those words uh, the same, what if a man were to gain the whole world but lose his soul? (laughs) Makes that uh, sound really important. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's exactly what it felt, felt like. But, you know, it was one of those things where, uh, for me, it it was more than just like, oh, you know, I'm a physician, so I could have easily called up a buddy and said, give me an antidepressant, a Xanax or something, you know, to make it all go away. But, you know, that wasn't going to really fix the problem. And, you know, we talked about, like, um, just the different lifestyle changes that go with that. When that happened, I was already living outside of the big city where I thought just all of that, the stimuli from – the stressors and everything from um, from living in those type of atmospheres, but that didn't change it. So whether it was a big town or a small town, it was just a, a lack of appreciation of kind of the delicate system between work and rest. There's not a balance because that, that's just not realistic. It's a healthy ratio of work and rest so that you're getting appropriate amount of rest to keep you able to work. Mm. When you, as, as a physician, you, you, you said something that was, that was a trigger for me because uh, we had a person on a few podcasts ago. She was dealing with the opioid epidemic in Florida. And mm-hmm. a lot of those people were upper middle class, upper middle, uh, you know, well-to-do society, you know, but they, you know, they had these demanding jobs and what have you, and uh, they were easily pres- getting prescriptions for something that would take, quote, unquote, take the edge off. And so when you said, yeah, as a physician, obviously it would be easier for you to go that route. Um, and I guess it's easier said than done. I, I, I just want to, if you could kind of give some pointers to someone that's listening that maybe, you know, what, what are they talking about? I, I have my kids. I have my full-time job and I have all this other stuff and they're thinking about taking me quote unquote, taking the edge off with a uh, prescription. Uh, What what are some indicators that they are in that red zone and what could they do to get around that? Yeah. Um, So what we're looking at is really what are some of the burnout indications um, to let Mm -hmm. you know that you're on the edge of burnout because that's what burnout looks like you get to the point where you want to escape. You want to escape your life, and you don't want to feel the pain or the distress or the discomfort of living how you're currently living. And so for, for a lot of people, that looks like withdrawal, you know, not wanting to be around people, uh, especially people who – who you, who you should want to be around, your family and friends. You don't just withdraw from the negative people, which is probably not a bad idea, but you're withdraw, withdrawing from everyone. Um, you have a tendency to be more of a people pleaser in those situations because the emotional aspect makes you feel a little bit more liable. So you're, you're less likely to stand your ground and, and to have strong boundaries because there's some underlying fear there that people won't accept you. And so oftentimes those people have a tendency to be more people-pleasing and wanting to do things to just kind of keep the peace necessarily than speaking their truth. Um, There tends to be a lot of physical um, symptoms that are just very vague, Um, things like headaches and muscle and back aches and pains that don't really go with anything, Uh, particularly people who say that they've been to multiple doctors and no one can tell them what's wrong with them, but they're they're just tired all the time and they can't sleep and their body aches all the time, but no one can find anything. If you've had adequate testing and everything's negative, there's probably something else going on than just a purely medical problem, Uh, something like a chronic rest deficit uh, or something like sleep deprivation or even dehydration for that matter for a lot of people. So there, there's multiple other things that can happen with that. Um, some people have difficulty concentrating. Uh, if your job is one that requires you to be innovative and to be uh, creative and thinking up new ideas and new um, solutions, and all of a sudden you can't do that anymore or that distresses you to even think about doing that, it seems like it's too difficult. 
all of those are signs that you're on the verge of burnout. And, and honestly, the simplest thing someone can do when they're on the verge of burnout is to, to say that they're going to take a vacation. And what I find is that that is so not effective because what happens is that vacation time, rather than really being a time of restoration where they are, they are focusing on restoring one of the seven types of rest or all of the seven types, becomes just a time for them to do activities away from home. So it's fun but it's not restorative and restful. And I don't have a problem with fun, but a burned out person needs more than fun. They need healing. Mm. So, Dr. Sandra, can you talk a little bit about what's the difference between getting plenty of sleep and being well rested? Because it's not the same thing. It's not. And, And probably the easiest way for me to start with that is to kind of, first of all, just kind of rattle off what the seven types of rest are, because sleep is just one of the seven, a piece of one of the seven. So there's physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative rest. And so sleep is actually a part of physical rest. It's the passive part of physical rest, sleep and napping. Whereas we also have in physical rest the rest that you get from things like yoga or from um, stretching exercises or from leisure walks, not where you're exercising to burn calorie kind of walking, but just walking to restore circulation and blood flow and improve respiratory rate. So that's the, the kind of the pulling apart of the physical types of rest. And for most people, when they think that they are tired, the, the number one thing they want to do is think that they just need more sleep. Well, that's not really going to solve any of the other types of rest. If your problem is purely physical, then maybe that would help. But if your problem is any of the other types of rest, then sleeping 8 to 10 hours is not going to solve uh, emotional rest deficit or a creative rest deficit. You have, the rest needs to be specific for the type of deficit that you're restoring. And that really depends on what kind of work you do. You know, different people pull on different reserves that they need throughout the day. You know, a teacher is pulling on the mental part with her studies and the emotional part of working with kids, or a construction worker is pulling on the physical part, maybe the creative part. So depending on the type of work you do depends on where your pull is coming from. And so you have to be aware of that because that's usually the area that you're going to become more deficient in. I have a, re- a question as it, crea- as it relates to the creativity and the creative side of rest, um, Dr. Sandra, because in the creative space, uh, you, on one side you hear, and I'm thinking more so of, of my friends and colleagues out in Silicon Valley and these tech bubbles around the country, you have uh, people like Steve Jobs and, and others in the 80s that were using alternative type of uh, the stimulants, if you will, and because of those stimulants, they were relying heavily on those to boost their creativity. And so now there's a segment of the population, at least in the higher tech area, that they're, they're embracing microdosing to enhance their levels of creativity. But just listening to you in these brief minutes, it sounds like initially that sounds like a great idea, but they are going to be... Uh, experiencing a lot of the burnout indicators you talked about before. Yeah, and, and wouldn't it be better to have a natural way to, create, to boost your creativity? Just like, um, you know, I don't have an issue with having a cup of coffee, but who wants to be dependent on caffeine at 4 o'clock to get you through the rest of the day? You know, no one wants to ever be dependent on anything. You want to be able to enjoy things, you know, enjoy the cup of coffee, enjoy, you know, different types of things, but uh, to enjoy sugars or things like that, but you don't want those to become the, your crutches for being able to to survive and to, and to thrive. And so, oftentimes with creatives, particular writers and artists, when they they you know kind of get to where they feel like they've lost their creativity, they're not coming up with new things. Um, the push to to do that, the push to create, starts um, causing kind of this. Um, downward spiral for them because they, they, the pressure to create takes away from their ability to appreciate the beauty in its creative form. 
And so for most creatives, when we talk about creative rest, we're talking about pulling away from that, the, that, that need to create beauty and to, to reconnect with experiencing it, a- allowing things that, that ex- inspire and awaken you to, to take the time to actually enjoy those. Um, for an artist, that might be breaking away from their own music to go out and enjoy someone else's, or it may be that they're into art, and that's something that wakes them up. Or it could be that traveling and seeing beautiful scenes from across the world inspires them. So it's different for each person, but that creative rest is that's that awakening uh, of awe and that liberation of wonder that comes when we are in the in creative beauty, whether that's artificially created, man-made through music or art and things of that nature, or if it's natural beauty that we're seeing. But that's it's the same reason why a lot of people say that they just feel so much better when they're around bodies of water. Why so many people flock to to live and have homes and and vacation homes and things at beaches, um, or around mountains and things like that, because it's not just being in those settings, it is what it does inside of them. um, There's been some recent research done that shows that when they did some MRIs on people who had uh, looked at oceans and bodies of water, that looking at the color blue and bluish greens and aquas actually has a chemical reaction, that on the MRI they could actually see activity in the brain that occurred solely by looking at these colors, these natural colors. And I think that's important because it's not in our head that we feel better, or maybe it is in our head since we're looking at the MRI, but it's not just this kind of psychological stuff. There is something chemically and physically happening. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, let me let me ask you this, Dr. Sandra. So when you were mentioning back in 2008 and you read that study and you said, hey, that's me, that's exactly kind of what I'm going through. Um, in my experience, when I've seen people, and we've all experienced, you know, being in a, in a, in a funk or not having any enthusiasm and just stressed and whatnot, but some of the people that I see pulling themselves out of that coincides with them finding their what some call their purpose or soul purpose or life purpose. Um, do you find do you find that too? The same thing? Um I think that's that different for different people, kind of how they look at it. I think everybody has kind of this core thing that seems to pull at them. Um, kind of their their niche where they just feel like they fit in, their thing that is that speaks to their heart. But I do think that to some degree that that changes to, based on what we're going through. Because, you know, at the if you had told me 20 years ago that <laughs> that one of the big things that I spend most of my time going into companies or standing on stages talking about would be teaching people how to rest better so that they could enjoy more of their lives, I would have laughed out loud because I, <laughs> because that that just seems so out there. And so now, when I when I'm sitting across from people, or when I'm getting emails or testimonials from people who ha- whose lives have been changed because of that, uh, you know, it it seems like a, like a destiny moment. But I wouldn't, you know, that's not something I would have even had considered a- at that time. Hmm. That's funny. It makes me think of uh, folks at Strategic Coach or some of these, you know, higher end coaching programs. You know, these are six figures on the low end, and a lot of the takeaways that I hear and and just follow up and follow through are some of these executives taking more time off from work. So. I think that the the paradigm is shifting where, like you said, it used to be a badge of honor. Oh, I can, you only did 80 hours, you ramp, you, you expletive or whatever. And now it's more mm-hmm. of when I take more time off, I can actually increase the bottom line. I, and I wanted to see, since you're, you're, you're in a lot of these audiences, how are, uh, a two-part question, so how, how are they able or are they able to measure how productive a person can be when they actually get rest. And I said it was a two-part because I can imagine there's more um, 
flexibility with private companies versus publicly traded companies. Yes, absolutely. Now, as far as the measuring, it's really to some degree, um, especially because a lot of the times when I'm doing this, it's with people who have those Silicon Valley type creative jobs. Um, a lot of my talks are with large groups of young people who are in media or who are producing things. And so a big part of what they are required to do is to be able to constantly be on their game and to be able to think with these kind of fresh, innovative thoughts. And the way that a lot of them have quantified to me on how they can tell how this has affected them, how they can tell that incorporating some of the things I teach, like body fluidity or uh, brain dumping when they start having those ruminating thoughts, um, some of those things when they start doing that is what they found is that before they started practicing some of the restful um, activities, they would get to let's say three o'clock, four o'clock, and and they were they were not they were not able to do anything. Their the company would not have any meetings after two because everybody was brain dead, and so it would be this like four hour block of time where you had people in the office, but they were essentially in a, ineffective. They they were there in body, but not there in mind and spirit. It's what we call presenteeism. You know, we've heard of absenteeism where people just don't show up to work. Well, now we have this phenomenon of presenteeism where their body's in the chair, but they are not bringing their best selves to the table. And that was, has been one of the biggest shifts is that people who come back and they tell me, now I get to that 3 or 4 o'clock and, and, I, and I feel good. I still feel energized. I can look at a new project that someone brings in and have fresh ideas pop to my mind, and that never happened before. Before, I would be so drained by the time I got to the end of the day, or my attention would be so, so splintered that I couldn't really focus my thoughts like that. And so that's, that's a huge thing for someone who, who has to, be, to stay innovative and who needs to not just have the first couple of hours of their day be effective, but able to, to carry that out throughout the whole workday. And as far as the types of companies, companies that are larger corporations, what typically ends up happening with them when we do um, wellness training within their organization, it's teaching not necessarily kind of these huge changes that require the company to put out large amounts of money, but they're small tweaks to help their employees feel better while they're at work. So um, teaching them things to help keep their, their, their bodies from being tense throughout the day, because a lot of people do leave their jobs with neck and back pain. And so teaching some simple ergonomic issues with how they're inter, uh, interfacing with their computers, with their, their laptops, how they're sitting in their chair, uh, even on factories, how they're standing while they're doing whatever they're doing um, so that their, their work is not damaging their body while they're there, that they leave the work and still um, have a healthy body and that they're not being um, broken down from the activities that they're doing at that job. What, what in your studies have, what professions are you finding that are, are the most people are experiencing the most stress? The most, uh, stress is, is, is rampant. <laughs> from, I don't know if there's actually one specific, because it seems to be rampant from, I mean, the emails I get come from anybody from C-level employees to homeschooling moms. So I'm not sure there's a specific one profession, but it, but it appears to be people who have, have to work with other people. So, um, you know, jobs where you're kind of more in customer service type activities, yeah. and especially those act, those customer service type positions where the employee kind of gives the mindset that the customer is always right, which mm -hmm. is not always true. So mm -hmm. um, that creates a bit of a, a, an underlying stress that can be overwhelming because you have you have to take a bunch of stuff that you probably didn't deserve. You know, you can't just lash out because they're screaming at you. You're having to just kind of take it. And so that's a special type of stress that I think any of us could understand would kind of feel like it's too much. But those kind of positions are hard. And there's not a lot you can do in the moment. You know, when, when a, employ a 
customer screaming at you for whatever reason, you're, let's say you're a waiter, and they're ticked because you got something wrong, and they're you know lashing out at you. Well, you can't just shove the food you know in their lap and storm out. You've lost your job. <laughs> you know, so there's got to be some level of control there. But then you have to realize that you know that that has brought you into a point of toxicity, because whether you admit it or not, it's gonna it's gonna create something, some anger inside of you. Some some issues are gonna happen. Some emotions are gonna occur. And so before you just go home to your your family or go home and kick the dog, you, you need to, to process that. Because, and you want to process it at work because it's not fair to everybody else who has to, to, to live with you to have to experience that. So for a lot of people, what I tell them to do when you get in your car, to take a moment to defuse, to work through that in your head, scream, hit the steering wheel, whatever you got to do, but work through that in that moment before you walk into that door and say something you're going to regret. What, what use does it do you to walk in and then say something snippy to your, your wife who now, you, now you've messed up two situations? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so um, I want to go back to the early 2000s where you started getting – a lot of these corporate campuses where, you know, you can get your laundry done, you had your daycare there, uh, you had your cafeteria <laughs> there, so you can pretty much stay there. Has that proven to be the ultimate model that you're – it sounds like you're on the surface or on paper, you're, you're getting that, that balance with work and rest because you can kind of walk away and play foosball and become more effective when you get back to work. Are you seeing any, any – uh, tangible results from that? That's becoming less of the norm now with most companies because that got, that's expensive. And yeah. most companies yeah. are trying to kind of keep the overhead a lot smaller than that. The, the goal there was trying to make work and life integrate with each other in a way that kind of was smooth. And so there, there is some benefit in some aspects of it, particularly a lot of companies still have um, that thought of having daycares that are very close if they're a large company with a lot of working parents because that does take an extra level of stress off from them. But the extra portion of that, the wellness portion, many of them have broken free from having that be a huge part of the in-company atmosphere and allowing things like gym membership to be part of their insurance programs and, and, and things like that so that you have a little bit more freedom in how you use your, your downtime, and the benefit really comes from those things that are kind of intrinsic, like child care and having, you know, providing meals and things like that that are intrinsic to your work day. Mm-hmm. On that same token, especially as a physician, um, I think it's the number two killer in the United States heart disease. So. What what are are you working with insurance companies as well to keep those premiums down? I mean, it seems like I mean you you listed a lot of burnout indicators that would lead somebody down that road, and are there ways to make it inevitable? I mean, obviously, I think there should be, but as a physician, I I think you would have a better input than I would. Yeah, the you know stress by itself worsens a lot of that. So just the the stress of having those types of um, high-pressure jobs predisposes a lot of people to high blood pressure, um, poor eating habits, you know, picking up fast food and things like that um, just because they don't have time when they're, they're running back and forth between jobs and things. So a lot, of, a lot of the lifestyle choices kind of add to that as well. And so mostly what happens with the insurance companies and what we recommend for a lot of companies who – find that they're having a large number of employees that are going out of work for, for specific reasons. For instance, let's say if, if 20% of your employees call out of work because of back pain, or you're noticing a large number of your employees are billing their, through their insurance with a diagnosis of high blood pressure or, or heart, heart disease, then what a company can do is actually look and see if there's anything that they're doing within their infrastructure that promotes that. Um, or if they're doing things that help to combat that, meaning 
some companies will offer like these yearly kind of weight loss incentives. Um, you know, okay, we're going to have weight loss. Um, we're going to have a weight loss program. So, who you know, whoever loses the most wins X Y Z, or something along the lines of um, we're going to have a Fitbit um, challenge, and whoever walks the most steps in this week, you know, wins something. So those types of intrinsic things to kind of promote health and to make people want to get involved, to make it kind of more of a community atmosphere where, you, you know, you get to do it with your, with your coworkers and it gets to be something that's fun and interactive um, is how we usually incorporate that with the insurances because most insurance companies will provide that to their, to their um, companies that are using them as really as, as metrics to be able to know where problems lie. Because really, if you're a company, let's say, that works with people standing on their feet all day, and, you know, set, let's say 70% of your employer, employees are having to see podiatrists because of um, fallen arches, you, you need to address that because you're paying mm. unnecessary money for something that you could just fit, fix on the front line. Um, you said something something that I, I really have to laugh <laughs> I'm going to laugh at, and I have a more flexible schedule, so, you know, bear with me on this one. And I never thought I would do it, but I want to say I am now 27 days without my Fitbit. And initially, I was like, everyone else, oh, I got to get my 10,000 steps and all this other stuff, and loving that jolt to my arm, meaning I was sitting too long. But I realized <laughs> that it was more stress. Uh, oh, my goodness, uh, what is this jolt? And then when I talked to other Fitbit owners, they were like, yeah, I'm just used to that little nudge, too. I, I don't necessarily get up from my, from my <laughs> seat. And I was like, you know what? That was some extra additional headache, heartache stress with having that thing on and I feel good after 27 days not having it now I could be an extreme example but I'd love to get your take on it no that's that basically goes to the sensory overload part of it and that's the thing everybody's different with kind of what works for them but sensory overload is when you're kind of all these electronics are, are starting to get to you and so if you're I don't know what your normal work situation is like but if you're typically are around a lot of electronics or sensory input, background noises, and things like that, then, yeah, it would be very reasonable for something like a, the Fitbit making noise or buzzing to be able to kind of be uh, kind of a, too much stimulation. And so whatever gut can remove becomes a type of sensory rest. You're basically specifically limiting some of the sensory input that you put on your body or that you allow into your body so that you don't feel like you're getting overloaded with it. Mm. Well, Dr. Sandra, if, as far as stress, obviously both males, men and women, we all experience it. But in, in your experience, do, do you notice that there's a difference between how men handle stre stress and how women, or is it pretty much the same across the board? There is some differences. Um, both have a tendency to, to just try to push through it. Um, and it really depends on the type of deficit. Women have a tendency to deal with a lot of emotional and social type stressors um, for the most part. And I, I find that that tends to be the area when they do the rest quiz where they have the biggest deficits is the emotional and social part. For mm -hmm. men, a lot of them, when they take the rest quiz, I find that they tend to have the biggest deficits in the physical and mental part. And they, I, now whether it's jobs, I mean, I'm not really sure the specifics on why that is, but across the board, uh, like I said, over 15,000 people now, uh, as far as looking at the different dynamics between men and women um, with the, the seven types of rest, that, that tends to be what I'm seeing. Um, and like I said, it, it's a matter of at that point in time, once they recognize which of the seven types that they are, the, of, where the stress is really hitting them, where they're having the biggest issue with the stress, is then going in and specifically um, counteracting that type of stress with a, a, a counter a appropriate type of rest to replace it. Hmm. So uh, I have a question about 
the power of silence. And you're talking about a lot of rest and, um, as you mentioned, sensory overload may be a problem with all the technology that's around us. Do, are you seeing people having a fear? I mean, because they say silence is golden, but it could also be very deafening if you're not used to it. And so I think a lot of these distractions may exist so we're not focused on the silence and what may come out of that. Um, is that part of your healing process as well? It is because um, you're very correct in that. You know, we, we're talking about with the mental rest part of it about the cerebral chatter. Well, the sensory rest part of it, some people don't want to hear their cerebral chatter, so they kind of try to drown it out with other noise. So, you know, that's why I hear a lot of times when people are, we were talking about um, earlier before the show, talking about commuting back and forth in traffic and things. So a lot of times what I find that people who have long commutes, they tend to do stuff that entire time. So they may, they may play a podcast or stuff. You know, they may listen to the radio. They may do whatever. I'll do an audio book. You know, there's a hundred different things that they can do. And all those things can, are good and they're beneficial. But the, the problem is some of them, they, they won't take even five minutes before they get home to flip it all off and just have some silence. And they get so used to the noise that silence, like you said, becomes kind of foreign to them. Because once they get home, then there's other noise. The TV goes on or whatever. So there's constant noise and constant activity. So when they lay down to go to sleep at night, this, the, the mind is only getting silent at that time. And I even find a large group of people who don't sleep to silence. They're sleeping to either white noise or they're sleeping to the radio. Um, and, you know, I don't have a problem with white noise, but white noise is just trying to drown out your cerebral chatter. So the, the goal is to get to that point where you, you learn how to do some mind dumping type uh, exercises to be able to clear your mental space so that you can focus a lot better and be able to learn how to practice that on a regular basis so that even in the middle of your day when you find that, you know, that conversation you have with your boss where you wish you'd said something else and so you replay the conversation for the next two hours in your head on what you wish you'd said, that you're able to let that go and not just let those thoughts kind of keep aggravating you so that you can't move forward and do what else you need to do. The second part of that is in relation to white noise. So I'm a big fan of Abraham, and I, and I know that they were talking about Esther not, you know, having that chatter and not being able to quiet that mind. And what actually enabled her to quiet the mind was white noise. So in this case, she was, you know, and I hope she's going to different hotels for her conferences, whatever. And she found that focusing on the air conditioning or the fan in the room helped her to relax so she was able to open up. So it wasn't necessarily quiet but it was the white noise that helped enhance where she needed to go mentally. And that's a, a type of me meditation. But people don't think of white noise as meditation because they're not meditating on, like, uh, you know, a specific thought or anything. But what they're, what they're actually meditating on is that repetitive sound. And so that's part of the mental rest aspect that some people do well with is being able to to solidify a focused thought on one thing rather than having their mind kind of jumping around on multiple things. And so that's why that works really well for a lot of people um, because it's, it's teaching you to focus even without, it's almost at a subconscious level to focus on that frequency or that repetitive pattern or sometimes there's even a, an asymmetric pattern, but you're able to focus your attention on that and away from whatever's distracting you. And so a focused mind, is, it's kind of like you're going on a straight line. It's more likely to go straight into a, a deeper level of sleep than one that's bouncing around and kind of swinging around these different thoughts. It can't seem to quiet down enough to be able to go into that, those non-REM stage three and four deeper levels of sleep. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Sandra, what, when did you decide uh, to write the sacred rest, recover your life, renew your energy, restore your sanity? 
That book was written, the, this over the past two years, after um, working with a lot of different people and uh, seeing how it was working with my own patients, I started looking at um, helping them be able to kind of use some of the seven types of rest. That's where the rest quiz was created. Um, I have them go to restquiz.com and do the free assessment there. Once they take their, get their results, then we kind of take a look at them. And at that point, they're not trying to attack all seven types of rest. They can show, we can look at specifically, okay, well, these are the two that you're having the biggest problem with, or this is the one you're having the biggest problem with. And we can then focus our attention on looking at how to get more of that type of rest. And that's what I do in the book, uh, Sacred Rest, is that for each type of rest, I go over some very specific things that people can do to get more rest in that particular area so that they're not kind of just like, okay, now that I know I need more social rest, how do I get that? You know, they actually can take a look. Um, there's three different ways that are mentioned because everybody's different with their own personality and likes, so you can kind of tailor it to fit what goes with, with your normal likes and dislikes. Okay. So the book winds up getting a life of its own, and it's pulling at you, and you're a physician and a mom, so how do you balance it all? Oh, I love it now because I, that, that's the thing about rest. Once you start looking at, once you know how you feel when you're at your best, you can tell when things are starting to get skewed. And so you become more demanding with your, with your request on yourself. So I'm really strict with my boundaries about what I do and don't accept uh, as far as speaking engagements and things. I take a look and make sure that it fits my priorities. Um, sometimes you end up saying no to good things, um, things that probably would be awesome and may even you know, produce a lot of income, but you start understanding that that's not as important uh, as your own sanity and your ability to stay strong and thriving in what you do and actually enjoying it. I love it. I love it because you're coming from an abundant mindset. So looking at, looking at it from another standpoint, how did you get to that point? Like someone listening may say, oh, well, that's Dr. Sandra, of course. Right, and if there's an opportunity that I can't take, I can't let it go. How can I say no to that? So, what, what was the first, when was the first time you said no, and it shocked you that you actually said no, and then you look back like, wow, I'm so glad I ultimately did say no. Oh, that's easy. Um, about two years before, I actually wrote the book when I was really big into my own rest journey. Um, and was at a really good place in my head and all, um, I got a book contract. And, and you know, this is, it was, would have been my third book at the time. I'd already written two books, but I got a book contract. And if anyone out there has ever thought about writing a book, to get a book contract from a traditional publisher is pretty hard to do. And I got that contract, and I looked at it, and it sat on my computer to be printed out for about two months before I finally wrote back to my, my agent and I said, I can't write this book. <laughs> I can't explain to you why I can't write it, but I can't write this book because I, I know what this is going to do to my schedule right now, and I don't have enough margin in my schedule for that. And I'm happy where I'm at, so I'm not writing this book. And so I, I, I felt, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, when, you're, when your creative work has to do with contracts and deals, it's hard to let a contract go or a deal go because, you know, you don't know where the next one's going to come from. And you don't want to kind of burn bridges in the market because work gets out sometimes. Well, she's difficult. You, know, you, know, you don't want to work with her. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you almost have to get to that point where you're, you are okay if you don't even get another um, because you feel like you've got to preserve yourself because otherwise – you get in one of these situations where we've seen many high-profile people who have committed suicide and gotten to the end of themselves. And that's what I felt like back in, when I was burned out. I felt like I was at the end of myself, um, like I was producing a lot of good stuff that people were benefiting from and that the world thought was great, but I wasn't benefiting from it. And I didn't think it was too great because I wasn't enjoying my life anymore. So, so for me, that, that was when I really realized, you know, if, if, 
another contract doesn't come, I'm okay with that. But I can't get back to where I was. It sounds like a, a very strong spiritual foundation, too, where you let go and let God. And then, you know, if something greater than you can see more than your mental or your two physical eyes can see, it's a allowance. And that's a great position of power. It really is. And honestly, that's where this book was birthed from. I had no intention of writing this book. But after I said no to that contract, and I was talking with a friend about it, and they had just kind of commented on what a different person I was. I mean, that was the comment. You are, you are a different – because I was smiling more. I was happy. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't such a – well, I won't go there. But, <laughs> no, I was a different person altogether. And, and she really just commented on that. She's like, what, what changed? And I told her, I was like, I, I learned how to rest well. And her comment was, you need to write a book about that. And I thought to myself, girl, you're right. I sure do. So I went ahead and started <laughs> going through the process. And this was like two years or so, um, or a year and a half after that one I'd said no to. But between that time, I kind of cleared out my schedule some. I'd started cutting back on some of my medical practice and doing more things on my website and more things remotely and more speaking. So my time had kind of shifted so that I was able, I had some um, margin in my life to be able to sit down and, and start writing. Mm -hmm. You know, so Dr. Sandra, me and Hamza both are big believers of, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. And just curious, when you were a child, grow, you know, as you were growing up, what were your, where did you see yourself or what did you want to be when you're growing up as opposed to where you are right now? Was it the same? Did you want to be a doctor or did you have totally other, uh, completely other, you know, ideas about what, who you wanted to be and what you wanted to do when you were growing up? That's, that's interesting. Hello? You knocked her off, David. <laughs> <laughs> the childhood question. Maybe she'll come back. Maybe a, her a phone. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, we actually lost her. Oh wow. Yeah, let's stay on for a little bit longer. It may have been the, it wasn't the childhood question, but <laughs> sometimes we ask questions in left field, and people aren't ready for it. I just wanted to know what she. You know, sometimes what our plans are, what we see, and we can, can be completely different than what actually ends up we end up doing. While we're waiting, that actually happened at when I was working with this client today. Uh, they have this new employee. She's like 19 years old. I think she's back. She I think we got disconnected. Okay. We did. I was like, David, you asked the hard questions. <laughs> I, it knocked us right off the phone. It was so hard. So, <laughs> do you want me to just pick up where I was at? Sure, go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I grew up with my uh, great-grandmother uh, after my mom died soon after childbirth, and my dad was in the military. So I grew up in kind of more of an impoverished-type setting. We didn't have a whole lot. And so my mindset growing up was one that was I didn't want to be broke. That was my motivation. And I think that was a huge part of why I was so driven and why I kind of felt like I couldn't rest because for me, everything that I had received, I felt like I had worked for. And so rest felt like I was going to be letting go of, of some of that work that I put in. Um, mm. I never wanted to be anything other than a doctor. I, I've never had any other aspirations. That was kind of the main focus. So some of the things I'm doing now are I would have never have guessed. Uh, you know, I had no desires to write a book growing up. I loved books. I loved reading. Um, I loved writing. But I, I had no desire for anything like that because my focus was so on getting through medical school and becoming a physician. And then, you know, once that was accomplished, it, it was like, okay, I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> but I, I think kind of like you said, sometimes you, there's just kind of this pull on your life where there are things that that become important to you because of your life experience and kind of what what's allowed to to um, to come into your life, 
And so that time of burnout was really kind of some, a bit of a transition period for me because um, when I first started experiencing that, that was around the time that I, my very first book came out, Set Free to Live Free, Breaking Through the Seven Lies Women Tell Themselves, because I had been telling myself a lot of those lies. And so it, I, it became kind of a launching pad of being able to speak up and to just speak what I was feeling and not letting my medical profession be a limitation. Um, I think sometimes we, just because we have trained for careers, doesn't mean that we have to allow them to be a box that we have to be stuffed inside of. Mm-hmm. That's what that was actually going to be my second part of that question that David asked because uh, we find that many people reach that burnout area uh, around mid thirties and such where they were living on paper and they had all the check marks off and now now they're like now what and am I happy with all these check marks like is it arbitrary now and what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Uh, do you hear that from a lot of people you deal with? Yeah, because and, and that was and I fully understand that because I'm that person too. I'm a type A personality, you know, Enneagram three. I want the job done. I want to know what the key points are. I want the check boxes. I want to meet some goals, and you know, <laughs> those things keep me going. That's how I'm hotwired. So I like all of that stuff. But the the thing is, uh, even in liking that. There has to, you have to still enjoy the, you, you can't always be in the next thing. You can't always be jumping to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. There has to be some level of satisfaction as you're kind of meeting some of these goals. And that was what I was missing. You know, I, I was checking off the boxes, but I was never really enjoying any of the mm-hmm. process to get to the box. I mean, even when you get to the point where the goal is met, I, I wouldn't even stay there long enough to celebrate. I was like, mm-hmm. what's next? I, I was co- constantly going through the next thing. And so I think, it's, I think it's great to, at some point, and I think everyone has to do it, there, there has to be a passion call that you, that you attach to. And it's, it's something that, that is not just a moneymaker, although you're, I, I'm a full believer that your passion will create income, but, it, but it, it's something that's kind of almost like a driving force in you where you would do it even if you didn't get paid, but people are going to pay you for it because you do it that well and because you, you bring such an energy to it that, that people want that. They can see and feel the energy that you bring when you're doing whatever that is. And that, you know, I have friends who, I have friends who are, are, who are professional authors who are, you know, cranking out three, four best-selling books a year who on the side have a cupcake business because they love baking and they are mm-hmm. darn good at baking. <laughs> so, so these mm-hmm. cupcakes are amazing. And so they, they're doing that not because that's going to be a huge moneymaker for them, but because that's something they truly enjoy doing. And I think that that's important to, to have those types of passion callings in our lives that we, that, and we have the, the, the freedom and the liberty to do them so that they don't feel draining. Because you're, you're right. Most people look at my life and they say, well, how can you do all that and then go speak here or go speak there? Because talking to people and, and helping them kind of come up a level, that's part of my passion calling. And so when I do that, I leave those experiences energized. I, I leave them fulfilled. And, and that keeps me going. That actually feeds me. It's part of my social rest because I'm able to be, in the, be around other people and feed off of their energy and then give back my own. Uh, well said. One thing that uh, we also talk about a lot is contrast. And so, you know, so to a person that is listening and they hear about burnout and some of the indicators, sometimes that setback could be that set up. Like you had to go through that burnout to actually take a step back to actually find your passion. And maybe that was that trigger that got you on the right direction. So, I mean, it, I, I've heard that even in, in our talk over this hour. It's like, the world's not ending if you actually take that step back. And as you say, you know, you do, you're taking part in these seven points of rest, you'll get a different perspective as to what, what's currently happening. And I know just listening to you, that, that was actually some good reminders for me as well. Yeah, because, you know, I think everybody kind of goes through those ups and downs, those peaks and valleys. 
and, and sometimes the valleys get so deep that you don't know if you can dig back out of them. But, you know, even the deepest valley has some type of purpose with it. And, and sometimes, as you mentioned, until you actually go through that, you may not really even find out what, what your passion calling is because you, you haven't gone through enough to even be able to, to know who you are and what you really like or dislike. And, you know, I think a lot of times when, we're, when we are in protective type settings, like as teenagers within your home and all of that, you kind of assume the thought processes of the people you're around because they know more, they're more experienced. But as you get into your 20s, and particularly once you're in your 30s, you you start really getting a good feel for what your likes and dislikes are, what's important to you and what's not important to you. And it may not necessarily be what your parents and your family, you know, had told you should be important to you because (laughs) you're not all hot-wired the same. You're not all – you don't all have the same uh, desires um, for life and even for – and the same talents and giftings. So – I think it's important to have that time to be able to do that, but you can't always do that when you're grinding it out, you know, and and unfortunately, when you first get out of college and you don't have any money and you've got to pay bills, you know, the grind is on. You've got to make money and you've got to to crank out the outcome, but there has to be a time when you actually back off a little bit and start really looking at things because otherwise, like you said, you get to that point where you're 35 and you're like, what, what, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, I'm not mm-hmm. happy. I don't love this woman or guy I'm with. Who are these people in my house eating my food? You know, you're, you're just like, <laughs> I'm, I'm out. I'm done with this. And so before you get to that point, it's important to take some time to say, let me take a look at this thing. Well, you know, what is it I really enjoy about, uh, about my job? And if you hate it, what changes do I need to start looking at to, to switch this thing up a little bit? What, you know, do I need to get out or do I need to just tweak it? Because for me, and a lot of doctors do this, you hear a lot of doctors are leaving clinical and going to non-clinical jobs. I, I still love seeing people in the hospital and seeing people at my office, but I knew that I needed something else to supplement that because that by itself was just very draining to me. So what I did was I went to a kind of a, a part-time practice where three days a week I'm in the office, I go to the hospital still, and then two days a week I allow room for the other things I love doing, to go speak, to write, to do those types of things. And I made it very clear to my patients, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I have all the patients I can take care of. I don't want any more patients. I am maxed out, so don't go referring your grandma or anybody else to me. I don't have room so that, you know, they understand that I'm not trying to be snobby by not accepting additional patients. I'm not accepting additional patients because I know my limits, and I can't serve them well if I overextend myself. Yeah. Makes total sense. Uh, I thought you had a question there, David. No, no, I was just saying, yeah, that makes total sense. I was just kind of commenting on what she was saying. <laughs> sure. I, I'd be remiss, Dr. Sandra. I know we're at the top of the hour. We've got to gotta head out. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. So you're having these burnt, uh, not you, but you talked about these indicators and people having problems with sleep and so on. Uh, in recent years, and I guess it's just my awareness, uh, there's been a talk of sleep apnea and snoring and and actually getting CPAPs and people have been uh, of all weight classes, uh, athletes or overweight, it didn't matter, and people using CPAPs to actually boost their energy because they were blocking off uh, air passages while they're asleep. Um, how, how much does sleep apnea, is it, is it affected by uh, some of these burnout indicators that you're talking about, or is that something else entirely? Uh, it's a little bit different. The burnout Sleep, you can have burnout and not have sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, for most people, is a structural issue with their uvula and how their uvula moves when they're laying flat. So, and it definitely will affect your energy level because the aptic episodes can get excessively low. You know, a typical oxygen level, if I checked yours right now, would be like 98%, you know, at the lowest, maybe 95% or something. But with, um, and normal for most people is 90 or higher. Now, like I said, most people are way higher than 90, but that was what we consider a normal range. At sleep, when someone has sleep apnea, I mean, they're seeing it as low as 70s or 60%. 
So they're getting wow. a significant amount uh, of less oxygen going to their brain, their muscles. You can imagine, you know, when you're breathing, if you're, only, if you're getting 40%, let's say, less oxygen in, then the places that are going to suffer are those that are furthest away from your, from your heart and your lungs and even your heart and lungs not getting even the full amount. So what happens is it strains the heart and you have more high blood pressure. Most people with sleep apnea wake up with higher blood pressures in the morning, some excessively high, um, because the heart's been kind of fighting for oxygen all night long. They wake up in a, a headaches usually with brain fog because the brain has been uh, um, functioning on 30, 40% less oxygen. And usually they have pain in their legs and, and hands, the feet and lower legs, because those are the areas that are furthest away from the body and the vessels down there are smaller. So you can imagine that's, that's a toxic situation to wake up to in the morning and then have to start your day because you're already, uh, you know, you're already zapped out. You haven't even gotten started. So when you mm-hmm. give those people the CPAP, it pushes all that oxygen in and gets their numbers back up to those 90s and higher so that they're, they wake up with their body kind of fully oxygenated and able to work at its best. Gotcha, gotcha. And you have any other questions, David? Um, no, I think we covered, we covered a lot. She answered you did, and You did. It, it was, I mean, I can't – this hour always flies by whenever we have these talks. Um, one last one. We, we did have a, a guest on, and we – we're talking, and David and I actually tried this. We were doing uh, what's called hypersleep, and it was actually tricking our body to, once you wake up, still see if you can go back to sleep. And it, it was, for me personally, David, you could share your experience, but my creativity levels were through the roof just because I had never done that before. I was used to, you know, the regular eight to nine hours of sleep, and I wound up sleeping an extra, what, eight hours, and it was just like, what is going on? And, and I haven't done it consistently, but I don't know, Dr. Sandra, if you've ever even heard of hypersleep or anyone taking or benefiting from elongated hours of sleep. Yeah, and that's the thing, though, because most people don't have those extra hours like that. You, know, you mentioned not being able to kind of continue it because, you know, a lot of times you don't have those extra hours. That's the same response that I'm getting from creatives when they do the seven different types of rest, when they actually start incorporating these different types of rest within their life, that exact same response. Because th- what's happening is their body is getting kind of that restoration, that, that pouring back in that they're needing so that it keeps the energy level high and it keeps the creativity um, fresh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That means we've got to get back on it, David. Yeah. <laughs> so I know about the restquiz.com, and how, how can people get in touch with you to learn more about this, to work with you for the seven points of rest and to pick up your other books? On my website, that I choose my best life.com, and on the resources page, that's a good place to start. There's a lot of free resources that they can tap into. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I'm David. And Dr. Sandra, it was a pleasure. Let's definitely stay in touch. Awesome. It was great talking to you both. Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homies Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.